Hello, Ray Phoenix here, welcome to Let's Play Strikers 1945, part two. And this time around, we're playing the next half of the game. It's just like the first half, only it's way more harder. This really defines a bullet hell shooter zone. You never played a real bullet hell shooter until you played the second part of Strikers 1945. This, I really have to pump some more quarters in, but good thing I'm rich in quarters, otherwise it'd be impossible to get through this. You have to have like laser accuracy if you want to survive all this stuff. It's a lot easier doing a phone, ironically enough, they said in the previous video, because you guide the, the ship with your, guide the plane with your finger. So you see there's hazards everywhere, there's bullets flying at you from all, from all 360 directions that are possible. There's way too many directions possible in this game, now. there's more than you could possibly fly your ship around. It's hard to dodge things or stuff like that. This is pretty much, you know, like a big... You know, you know this is, like I said, it's bullet hell. This is what a bullet hell shooter is. That's what this game has become. It's hard as nails. This is how, but we're going to get through this because I have enough quarters. Because that's all it's about. It's all about the quarters. People have made this game perfectly did this. So you can, so they get more quarters off the, the off their pigeons. Which be us, the people playing the game. We are their pigeons, essentially. So they want to make as much money from us as possible before we, you know, so so they could, you know, become rich. People who own an arcade machine of this would become millionaires in a short amount of time. If everyone fought like me about this game, people would be playing this game all day, every day, and they'd be playing the same thing, oh, they'd be playing the same game over and over again. They need several arcade machines of this. They'd be making so much money that, you know, they would, you know, become rich pretty much. So, and the bosses are not really announced anymore. It doesn't really say what level you're on anymore. It doesn't say any of that stuff. It doesn't say who the bosses are or any of that, anything or who your target is. It just assumes you know how to play the game. So go through. We just cleared, uh, cleared that level again. And boy, we just got killed several times. We're still, we just barely got through the first level of this other mode. We're going to constantly be getting shot. I hope you like seeing me get shot down because you're going to be seeing that a lot in this in this part of the game. Because of how, you know, like how hellish this is. All the bullets that are flying everywhere. Good thing you have nukes in this game. You still have gold. You can still collect gold. But it doesn't reset your score either when you start, when you continue to start a new game. Because some games, you know, reset your score. This game doesn't do that. It still keeps accumulating your score. So we'll see what our true score is at the end of the game when we're finished the game. Well, it's not that it really matters. You know, no one really plays this game for score. Play this game if they want a good story. I mean, there aren't really any cutscenes this game. We kind of know the basic story is that, you know, there's terrorists and we have to fight against these evil terrorists that are, have everything imaginable. All sorts of firepower and weaponry and all kinds of stuff that can just destroy us and like two seconds it comes flying at us out of nowhere it's really hard to predict everything and like i said you need to like have a crystal ball if you want to predict the outcome of this game you have to have like a, you have to have like extreme like thin accuracy pretty much like you have you have to have like like you know it's like like performing microsurgery is probably requires less accuracy than getting through something like this <laughs> Maybe I should be a surgeon then if I should go through something like this. That's, but look at that, like how the frick am I supposed to dodge all that stuff? All those bullets that are flying everywhere, how are you supposed to? It's not, I don't even think it's possible to dodge all that. Especially the speed the game plays, it too plays it really fast. We always wear the phone version of this game, the mobile version plays it in slower speed. So this is the arcade, we keep wanting you to get money off you. And the phone still technically do that too, because the phone keeps wanting you to buy upgrades for the game and pay for stuff so you can keep playing the game using actual money. So in a way, the phone version, the mobile phone version actually isn't much different from the real arcade version. It might even be worse than the arcade version, so I want you to spend at least a few dollars if you want to keep playing the game. So it's actually kind of worse in that sense, because of how much money they want you to spend on stri playing Strikers 1945. It's worse than the arcade, the arcade only charged a quarter. I think New York arcades might charge a dollar, maybe, or a few quarters, or something like that. It's you know, the way inflation works. Inflation is there. Even the arcades got hit by inflation. That's why a lot of arcades nowadays just have a pass, like a play pass that you get. So you can play games on an infinite number of times, though if in a certain in time frame. I guess that's why. Because other people don't really like carrying quarters around anymore. And they want people to, you know, pay again. They want to get a good amount of money from people. So it might give them incentive to want to keep coming back in. It's more convenient than just carrying quarters around. But I actually kind of like the quarters, I think I mentioned in the first part. So you see, their planes now are even stronger. I forgot to mention that too. All the enemies in this game are even stronger. Sometimes the enemies even vary as well, too. They actually appear in different forms sometimes, too. Some, sometimes. And I swear this game's random. I think one time there was like an enemy near the end of the game. Where is that anime chick that lifts up her dress and shoots stuff at you? I swear there were some times I played this game where instead it was a ghost magician figure that just keeps shooting magic at you and you have to dodge it and shoot at him and kill him pretty much. Hey, look, at least we destroyed that plane this time around. This, remember the first time I figured we didn't actually get to destroy that plane so strong? We, we damaged it. We actually get destroyed. This time I actually did destroy it. Maybe he's weaker this time around, or maybe our weapons are better this time around. I don't know, I don't think you get really any weapon upgrades in this game. I mean, you could do, like, power-ups, I don't think they're permanent at all. You lose all of them when you get killed. 
But you can collect power-ups again, but you can, like, you can, like, get power-ups. I'm trying to... I, I never actually, never actually, like, really paid attention much to that, like, how much, uh... How many upgrades? How many times your weapon possibly get upgraded in this game? I don't know. I doubt most people really care about stuff like that. What is that? What is that the lowest level possible? It still does a decent amount of damage. You see, we just destroyed the breastplates on that robot thing, that transforming robot thing. Just have to keep shooting the crap out of him now, and then he's gonna explode as such. And now, there, I think we destroyed him. Yeah, we killed him, so it's time for the next level. I, just, I lost count of what level we're on now, so then say what level you're going to. So, of course, as per usual, we're going against the tanks now, because yeah, you know, the enemy likes using tanks, these terrorists. Terrorists must have invested a lot in tanks. I wonder how much this invasion cost the terrorist forces. It must have cost them a lot of money to build all these, this whole invasion force. But I wonder what economics is like where they're from. I don't know, maybe economics are completely different. They're just how they're able to build such a large, incredible force that could easily take, that took over the world in 1940. Of all sorts of resources, these are some of the most elaborate terrorists ever. Terrorists in real life don't have anything like this. If terrorists in real life did have stuff like this, we would be the- they would be our puppet masters right about now. And the really, good thing too, using a nuke destroys all the bullets on the screen, so if you ever have some nukes available, just use them when there's a lot of bullets on the screen. And, and, and nukes don't carry forward in other lives, you can earn more nukes, but if you get killed, you're gonna get reset back to two nukes, even if you have more than that. So I recommend using nukes as much as possible, so you get the most out of them, pretty much. It's good to get the most out of your nukes, pretty much. And sometimes another nuke appears that's like a bee swimming on it. And, and the power-ups just simply say P on them for power-up. They don't just say PAL like they did in Capcom's 1942. I used to like to think there are connections between this game and 1942, so I see it as. Capcom's 1940 series is set during World War II, and now World War II has ended, so we need something more to continue the story. I like to think Psycho or Psyche or whatever you say the name of this company. I like to think they did that justice by making these 1945 games. I don't think that's how it actually is. I don't think these games have anything to do with each other, but it does seem like that a lot. Even Wikipedia doesn't really know much about that, about the influences behind this game. Because there isn't really an awful lot of stuff about this game on Wikipedia, but we also we all know way too well. Wikipedia is never really a source of information. Whenever I do whenever I do information contests where you have to like where you have to prove something to me to, to have the truth or something, and then and then I give them a prize, which is usually a fancy schmancy dinner somewhere, I usually have to make them prove with official sources. And I don't include YouTube and Wikipedia as official sources, because they're not. My YouTube videos are not official sources of information. I don't, I don't think anyone will seriously go to my videos if they want real and good information on anything. I mean, it's just, okay, it is information. There's no guarantee that it's accurate at all. That's what you expect when you go on YouTube and Wikipedia, because, you know, those websites are full of bull. They say that the internet's 95% bullcrap or something. There are 95% of the information on the internet's bullcrap. And I think a lot of these games are bullcrap, too. Well, not well, all these games. I mean, this game does have some bullcrap moments. A lot of games have bullcrap moments in them. Some of the sequels do, like, like, um, like, Strikers 1945 3 is set in modern times. There's all kinds of, like, you know, it's like bullet hell kind of things and more. And, but yeah, it actually does do something to get around it, where you can actually play different planes that have, like, better, you know, that have better precision instead of that flying. The very average standard plane in that game, in, in the 1940, and I can't remember if it was in the third game or not, but I know in the first two there's a, there's a lightning, there's a plane called the lightning. It looks a lot like the plane you fly in the 1942. In Capcom's 1942, it's actually the worst plane in the game. It's called the Lightning. It's actually, it's actually the worst plane you could fly in the game. You think it'd be the best because it looks very standard and very like something that would be like the middle class, kind of like the X-wing from Star Wars, where it has average firepower and average bombing, kind of like middle. But no, it's actually slow and sluggish, and it's gonna get you killed most of the time. So yeah, it's pretty much a death trap of a plane, pretty much. So now we're being launched into space, I think. Now, yeah, we're getting launched into space. We have that thing to help take us into space. Apparently our planes can survive flying through space and survive the violent inferno of re-entry afterwards. If we're going after this space rocket over here, they have to destroy I'm pretty sure 1941, Capcom's 1941 had space rockets in it. I remember I used to comment when I played 1941 a lot that Capcom's 1941. I used to comment on how futuristic the game was. The game's supposed to be set in 1941. It's the only game in that series where you fight against the Nazis. And yet they have like unrealistic space rockets. They have laser cannons, starships, and things like that. And I see this game as kind of that's more that might be more influenced in the 1940 series in, in these in, in Strikers 1945. So see 1945, but it's way too high tech for 1945, or at least for our 1945. Even for theirs, it's just, just at par. But I thought, oh, it's four years after 1941, which is very high tech. So we'll make this game and make it even more high tech, I think. 
I wish I could find the people who made this game and ask them these questions. I really wish I could meet the development team behind this. I'd have a lot of things to ask them. Like, where'd they get the idea from this game from? Who thought it was a good idea to constantly put bullets in the game everywhere and constantly get killed? I think I know why. It was a marketing thing, obviously, because it's an arcade game where they want to keep making money off people. Okay, sorry now the answer to that question. I have to answer it right now. But what I really want to know is where they get the idea of this from Strikers 1945, Terrace 1945. I have to admit, it does sound like a very unique original idea. It's like in the Capcom games where it's just simply a fight against the Japanese forces at Midway or something like that. Or in Okinawa or something like that. Or, or like in 1941 where you fight against the Nazis. It's none of those things. It's a unique evil that's actually fight against after World War II. And so it actually, it actually does very unique. I definitely give, or give it credit for uniqueness. I think it is a really good idea for a story. I think we should have movies about stuff like that. There's so many movies about World War II and about wars that exist in real life. Why well, don't we make a movie that ties in for real war in real life like World War II but have it set right after? Have it be futuristic and high tech like this. I actually like that idea. I actually think, we should, I actually think, I think Hollywood should make movies like that. I feel Hollywood's always hungry for movie ideas for new movies and uh and, and, and things like that. So now we finally made it to the surface of the moon. This would look awesome if they made a movie about this. Seeing the moon up close or flying up to the moon. And then we and there shouldn't be any footprints there because no one's walked on the moon yet. Or at least our, 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 our actually the terrorists probably walked on the moon first. The first people on the moon were probably the terrorists in this case because they built all these outposts on the moon. That's what I'm starting to think there might be aliens because how else would someone in 1945 be able to construct all this? Oh, that's never a question I'm going to ask the people at Psycho or ever, ever, ever meet the people who made this game. I'm just willing to ask them a question like that. What, what, where, 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 were these really ter are these terrorists human? Or are they some sort of, you know, like space entity? Well, we know at the end there was space entity that did all I don't know, maybe space entity has some sort of godly magic or something like that that made them do all this. I don't know, maybe that's the case. And there's that anime thing again, it's flying around and it's lifting up its dress and shooting stuff. That is. And so we already destroyed that part, it's actually kind of easy to destroy. I still even, as I mentioned earlier, that sometimes that thing actually becomes some sort of magical figure, some magical man figure. It looks like something out of Sailor Moon or something like that. This flies around and shoots magic at us and wants us to get killed. Apparently there were some Sailor Moon video games that came out around this time too in the 90s. There was one on the Genesis apparently I never actually played before. I was never really into Sailor Moon that much. I didn't know until recently that Sailor Moon was really for adults. I really started getting into it when Kuma Taro's cake started and starting to mass upload the scenes or clips from from uh, from Sailor Moon onto their YouTube channel. I think that's good that they do that. You know, they'll preserve, you know, Sailor Moon show. The have been show really what Sailor Moon is. The best parts of the show kind of thing. They also, and they also gave me a good birthday present once too a few years ago where they where they made a video where, where, where that scene from Cat Dog where me and Bob accidentally gets ejected into space and falls into the sun. There, that scene was nowhere on YouTube. So Kumo Tarsuke, if you're watching this video, thanks again for doing that. I really, I really appreciate that you did that. I still think that was really funny though, that me and Bob got thrown into the, into the sun. I looked it up on YouTube the next day and my disappointment, that scene wasn't anywhere on YouTube. So, it's good that we preserve it. I also preserved it too by uploading it to my Discord server. My Discord server, you know, is allowed to, people are allowed to like upload short little video clips like that. But then again, if you know Discord, they have, um, they're very, they're very like, um, they don't, they don't want you uploading something that's more than 8 megabytes. They're really stingy on that sense, unless you pay for the Discord Nitro, which costs like several hundred dollars a year for something like an annual subscription for several hundred dollars. Which, I, as much as I like Discord, I don't think it's worth paying that much just so I could upload longer videos to Discord. I would use archive.org first before I use Discord. I do upload a lot of stuff to archive.org. This is getting uploaded to archive.org too. It's a good way to back up YouTube videos as well too, as well as, you know, it can be used to back up anything pretty much. So we're at the, like, the second last boss in the game, one of the last bosses this game, which is Space Crab again, that's a lot more aggressive this time around than it was the first time. And there's the other part of the final boss, I think that's watching well, that, I think, remember, is that the second last boss, I think, remember, is that the final, is that part of the final boss, I think, where it forms in the final boss, some sort of space thing again. So we're still on the moon, I think, or something, maybe we're beyond the moon, I don't know. I lost my chapter, we're still on the moon, it's like a moon base they built here. And, and, and because the moon doesn't change very much, the surface of the moon doesn't change much, if they built this year in 1945, it should, it should still be here today, pretty much, in the universe of this game. Which would make sense, because they actually did make a sequel called Strikers 1999, and I'm pretty sure it had something that... Or maybe it did, I don't remember, I don't know, I haven't played Strikers 1945 free, which is called Strikers 1999 in, in Japan, which I actually like that title more. It's set in 1999. I, I, don't, I, don't, I haven't played that one as much. I actually have it on my phone. I, mean, I did play it a few times on my phone, but I don't really play enough to like really memorize like what happens. But I played this one a lot more. I'm very familiar with this one. 
So we destroyed the first form of the boss. I think that's going to form into something else now. It's going to form into a more advanced, vicious-looking crab with bullets that are impossible to dodge. At least you get unlimited continues by constantly putting quarters in the machine. And too bad Gekio Shooting King doesn't do that. I, I've never beaten Gekio Shooting King on the PS1 before, for that very reason. You, you get unlimited continues. It always starts you off at the beginning of the final boss every time you mess up. And you have to have, like, really thin accuracy again to beat the final. It's like, how, does, how do people do it? Especially with PS1, which I play a game with PS1 controller. You know, it's really, it's really, it's really impossible, really, to, you know, dodge all those bullets at the end of the game. That's why I've never done a Let's Play of, of Gekio Shooting King. Even on easy mode, it's like that. I actually try playing on easy. And same thing. It's like that in every mode game. Heck, even hard mode does the same thing. So I might as well play on hard mode then and claim the best thing for it. So, yep, that's how the game ends. You, we beat the game and we get to enter and it just simply says, the end. It just leaves it very simple as that. You know, it's a good way to end a game. I guess we know we destroyed the main villain, so what more is there to say? Centering our name, we've got the highest score possible. So yes, that concludes this playthrough of Strikers 1945's Ray Phoenix, signing out.